In this video, I'm going to be in the mostly vacant neighborhood of Delray. I have geese coming at me here. Hold up. Nonetheless, in this video, I drive around the neighborhood that is Delray, and I'll tell you more about it along the way. Psh, stupid Canadian geese. Just like everything else that comes from Canada. <laughs> all right, all right, Canada, just kidding. I'm only kidding about half of that, though. I mean, Canadian geese are probably the most good-for-nothing protected creatures in the world. All they ever do is take dumps everywhere. At least, that's how I feel about it, and I know for a fact that many other people do, too. Anyway, speaking of dumps, this is... Delray, a neighborhood of Detroit. All right, sorry people, that was mean. I lied, see? Just like the sign says, Delray isn't a dump. Many people treat it like one though as they drive on over from their home or business and dump out all of their trash throughout the streets of the neighborhood. That's sad because there's still some people that live here. Not many though. This happens to be my second video on my Detroit series and Delray is located in the far southwestern portion of Detroit. Today, it's mostly vacant. If you saw my previous Detroit video on Detroit's most polluted zip code, Delray is located downwind of southwest Detroit's industrial area, and that's a big reason as to why Delray looks like it does today. Really quick, as if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the YouTube algorithm. Also make sure to hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, then you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos on other places like what you see here can be found in my Detroit playlist, my American Hoods playlist, or in my Michigan playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. First, we're going to go through the area that is known as Carbon Works. It's a fairly small neighborhood, and most people just consider it to be a part of Delray. This section is bordered by the massive Detroit water and sewage facility to the southeast. Carbon Works was originally a village, and it got its name in 1874 after the Michigan Carbon Works Company, which broke down animal bones into charcoal to use mainly for fertilizer. By 1884, the company had a 50-building complex across 100 acres of land, and it was said to have been the largest carbon works site in the world. It was also the largest industry in Detroit at the time. Access to the Detroit River and railroad lines made this area heavily industrial beginning in the late 19th century, and the communities nearby, such as Carbon Works and Delray, saw massive growth as immigrants flocked to the area to find work as there were plenty of jobs. Living nearby to the factories at the time meant an easy commute to work, but as time went on, people started to realize the negative effects of the air pollution that these industries caused. People realized how badly their health was affected, and beginning in the 1950s, people started to move from this area, and today, it looks like this. Above you can see the towering I-75 Rouge River Bridge, but now it's time to start on the story of Delray. We'll start all the way back in the beginning, as early as the year 750, as that is when several Native American burial mounds were built here on what used to be some small sandy bluffs along the Rouge River. The tallest mound was 40 feet high and was known as the Great Mound of the River Rouge. There are believed to have been many other such sites throughout southeastern Michigan, however as the land went back and forth between French and British rule, many of those sites were destroyed by either party. The mounds in Delray, however, were able to survive as this was mostly a marsh that was a part of the Rouge River Delta. Looking at a map of the area today, you would laugh at the notion of the Rouge River Delta, but that's what was here before it was drained out to build up the area that we see today or the area that used to be here. Today, Zug Island and the Detroit Wastewater Facility lie at the spot where the mounds used to be. 
Going back to 1812, a military highway was built through the area with the intention of connecting Detroit with Fort Meigs in Ohio, which is southwest of Toledo. In 1822, the highway was resurveyed and today, that highway is Jefferson Avenue. After the highway was completed, people began to purchase land in the area to farm. In 1836, the town of Belgrade was platted, as that was the original name of the place. Now a few early settlers of note were named Alicia and Carolyn Chase, and that's significant because they bought the land that the Great Mound of the River Rouge was on in the area of Jefferson Avenue and West End Street. They decided to tear up the mound and sell the sand that made up the mound. They supposedly found many skeletons within the sand, but they just dumped them out into the Rouge River. Anyway, on October 14th, 1851, the community was officially called Delray, which was a suggestion by an early resident who was a war veteran and came across a community in Mexico that was called Molino Del Rey. Currently, we're on what used to be one of the main drags through Delray, but in the 1850s, Delray was still a rural farming community. However, Detroit's economy started to boom shortly after. In the 1860s, factories started to spring up at a rapid pace in Delray and the area that surrounded it. Some of those industries included the large salt mine that sat underneath the soil of Delray. The Detroit Edison Company built a power plant here in 1903, which got rid of some of the old Native American earthworks. Zug Island was formed in 1888 on land that was once a marsh as people wanted to build a new shipping channel to help the Rouge River be more navigable. The name Zug comes from Samuel Zug, who owned the land before it became industrialized. Shortly after in 1901, Detroit Ironworks built a factory on Zug Island. As the area's economy was booming in the early 20th century, Delray's population boomed as well, as there were jobs to be had. Immigrants from all over came to settle in Delray, including people of Polish, Mexican, Armenian, Italian, Irish, African American, and Hungarian descent. In 1897, Delray was incorporated as a village, but not for long, as in 1906, Detroit annexed Delray. By 1920, Delray was said to have had the largest Hungarian population in the world outside of Budapest. By 1930, the neighborhood's population peaked at 24,000 people. Delray was an appealing place to live, as it was close by to thousands of industrial jobs. Henry Ford's Dearborn assembly plant was also not that far away. Side note, as Motor City Industries apparently was a small metal stamping plant that seems to have been abandoned recently, I couldn't find much else on it. Obviously, the streets that we're driving on today are mostly empty, but back then they were thriving as they were full of occupied homes and there were plenty of stores along the main streets throughout the neighborhood. By 1930, Delray hit its peak population of 24,000. Shortly after, everything rolled downhill starting once the city of Detroit built their wastewater facility here, which destroyed over 600 housing units during the process. Wide flight became a thing starting around the 1950s, and some of Detroit's first suburbs began to pop up towards the south and west. By 1950, Delray's population was around 17,000, and it was around this time that people started to realize the negative effects of all of the air pollution from the nearby industries. The city of Detroit then began its plan on phasing out all of the residential zoning in Delray, with the idea of making it purely industrial in the future. That of course made some residents mad as protests have been had throughout the years, most of them occurring in the 1960s and 70s. Despite some unrest here and there by the residents, the population decline continued as most people realized that it was within their own best interest to move as the air pollution continued to get worse. Crime has always been a big issue here as well, and in fact, in the 1980s, it was believed that Delray was the most dangerous neighborhood in the city. Today it's not really all that dangerous as there's nothing here. It's just sad looking and you're left to imagine what this place used to be. The crime that happens here today mostly is illegal dumping as it's an easy place to not be seen while you get rid of whatever trash it is that you're hauling around in the back of your pickup truck. Let's say you're back here getting rid of your trash. On certain streets, there's nobody to be seen, and even if somebody does notice you, it's highly unlikely that the cops will come as the city tries to use all of their police resources for dealing with the extreme amount of violent crime that occurs throughout the city. 
Other police officers are used to patrol downtown and other populated areas of the city. Detroit is a city that was built for nearly 2 million people, but today it has under 650,000 living in the city limits. From a financial standpoint, you can see why the city would want to transform Delray from being residential to being completely industrial. And when you consider the amount of industrial pollution that this area has faced over the years, it makes sense to do just that. Going back to the population history, after seeing a peak population of 24,000 in 1930, in the year 2000, Delray had only 3,100 residents left. In 2010, the population was 2,780, and in 2020, it's now down to 1,800. Most people, including myself, believe that it's only a matter of time before Delray's population is zero. There's currently a project going on in the eastern half of Delray, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but it has taken out several blocks of what used to be Delray. And for reference, for the entire video so far, we have been in the far western half of Delray. And this is West End Street, which is another street that used to be a main drag through Delray. You can see that some old buildings still stand along here that used to be shops. As a whole, Detroit has been fighting population decline since 1950. The city has had a hard time fighting its issues with crime, and the city has been forced to raise its taxes to make up for the revenue loss that came with the sudden surge of population decline. Not to mention the decades of corruption among the city leaders. Think about if you lived in Detroit in the 1960s when people started to move out of the city. You see that there are nearby suburbs that are popping up and they offer a better quality of life, along with lower taxes, less crime better schools? If you had the option to and you were raising a family, wouldn't you want to move to the suburbs too? No other city in the United States has lost more people from its peak population than Detroit has, as the Motor City has lost 1.2 million residents since 1950. Oftentimes, people that make videos on Detroit will say that it's the decline of the auto industry, and they'll center their whole conversation around that. And while there is some truth to that, the Detroit metro area hasn't seen the same population loss that the city has alone, so that's only a small part of the story because if that was the whole story, wouldn't the entire region be experiencing the same population decline? Anyway, today, people are continuing to leave Detroit, whether it's for the suburbs or out of southeastern Michigan completely. Delray is one of the more extreme examples of abandonment in Detroit. Not all neighborhoods look this empty. Current Mayor Mike Duggan, who is now in his third term, mentioned that one of his goals is to remove all urban blight in the city limits within the next few years. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a tough ask, and probably won't happen, as there's just so much of it throughout the city. It is getting better though, and some of the videos throughout my Detroit series will show some of those positive things. Now you might have noticed a handful of churches that still stand throughout the neighborhood. I mean, how could you not with their architectural details? Some of them are still in operation while others are left standing empty. I can only imagine that all of these churches will soon go as the neighborhood has gone. Maybe I'm wrong and maybe they'll stay standing, only time will tell. Meanwhile, I haven't yet emphasized enough how big the Hungarian culture was here early on. Hungarians in the early 20th century flocked here not only from overseas, but also from other Rust Belt cities such as South Bend, Toledo, and Cleveland. Newspaper articles from the Detroit Free Press described Delray as a Hungarian colony. Other noted references for Delray included the name Hunky Town, in which was a slur that referred to Central European immigrants. The neighborhood was full of such a diverse group of immigrants that some historians have noted that you could live your life in Delray without the ability to speak English. As the neighborhood declined though, Detroit's Hungarian community flocked towards the suburbs such as Allen Park, Lincoln Park, and other downriver suburbs. 
In the press, you'll see a lot of photos of abandoned neighborhoods with the skyline of Detroit in the background. Right here is a pretty cool shot. You can also see the Ambassador Bridge. Meanwhile, on the south side of Melville Street, you have several houses, but on the north side, you have this fenced off industrial yard where there's just a bunch of chemical tanks sitting around. Straight ahead, you can see that there's a large construction project going on, which brings me to my next talking point, the Gordie Howe International Bridge. Upon completion, this bridge will be the longest cable-stayed bridge in North America, with a span of over half a mile. The height of the towers will be 722 feet. In comparison, that's only 5 feet shorter than Detroit's tallest building. In 2013, the United States approved the project and it officially broke ground in 2018. The project includes a U.S. port of entry that will take up 145 acres of land that used to be a part of the Del Rey neighborhood, which is the construction that you see going on here. This drone shot was taken on May 29, 2021, followed by a drone shot that was taken on November 6, 2021. In the second drone shot, you can see that the construction has begun on the pair of 722-foot towers. Back to how this project affects Delray, as in order to build this massive project, land had to be purchased, even though the section of the Delray neighborhood that the customs area will occupy was already in horrible shape, just like the rest of the neighborhood, there were still over 400 families who were affected by this project. To help solve that issue, the state of Michigan and the city of Detroit chipped in to help those families relocate to another home within Detroit. The package included an offer to help renovate the homes that these families would relocate to. Another obstacle that the Gordie Howe International Bridge faced was the Maroon family, as they own the Ambassador Bridge. Today, the Ambassador Bridge is the busiest international crossing between the United States and Canada. Many people believe that the Maroons didn't want any competing bridge taking away from the tolls that they were able to collect on the Ambassador Bridge. The Maroons attempted to stop the expropriations from the state of Michigan in the Delray neighborhood. Obviously, that didn't work, and ground was able to be broken in 2018. It didn't help the Maroons that both the U.S. and Canada really wanted this bridge to get built, Canada more so than the U.S. The bridge was proposed as early as in 2004 as the Detroit River International Crossing, and in 2011, Canada began building an extension to the 401 to allow for a complete freeway bypass of Windsor. Canada actually funded most of the project, including a significant portion of the buyout program that was given to the old residents of Delray, where the U.S. point of entry is being built. All in all, it was 5 miles of city-owned streets and 36 city-owned parcels of land within the Delray neighborhood that were purchased in order to build this project. Once complete, the bridge will have a total length of 1.5 miles, with just over half of a mile of that being the main span of the Cable State Bridge, which will make this bridge the longest of its kind in North America. There will be 6 lanes for vehicle traffic, whereas the Ambassador Bridge has only 4. There will also be a separate multi-use path along the bridge for pedestrians and bikes. The project will also include improvements to I-75, including four new road overpasses, five new pedestrian overpasses, widened roads at key intersections, and four bridges crossing the railroad tracks to connect the Gordie Howe Bridge to I-75. The project is expected to be completed sometime in 2024. So when I was here navigating my way through Delray, my GPS didn't realize that there were a handful of streets that were no longer streets due to the Gordie Howe International Bridge construction. 
Once I'm on 4th Street up ahead, you'll see me make several turns onto what are now going to be dead-end streets, as my GPS kept telling me to make those turns in order to get to the next set points that I had. In short, my GPS was confused, making me even more so confused. Anyway, Fort Street serves as the northern border of the Delray neighborhood. Unfortunately, this section of Fort Street looks just as beat up as the rest of the Delray neighborhood does. Fort Street is one of Detroit's spoke streets, as when you look at a map of Detroit, you have a set of straight diagonal streets that come to a point from all directions at Campus Martius in downtown. Here's one of the streets, as you can see up ahead, the road is closed for the Gordie Howe International Bridge construction. Sakti was an automotive manufacturer that opened up this space in 2014, but it didn't last long, at least to provide some modern manufacturing space to a section of town that could use it. Currently, some of the space is being rented out by a separate automotive parts supplier in Mobis. This was once a one-way street, heading the way that we are currently heading now, but once the construction started on the bridge, it became what it is now. And here's another original residential block of Delray. As you can see here, the far eastern end of Delray looks just as beat up as the other parts of Delray do.
straight ahead is the Mistersky gas power plant, which was built in 1950. Since we've already seen Fort Street, I skipped the video ahead to where Southwestern High School used to be at the corner of Fort and Post. This school closed in 2012 and served the Boynton and Oakwood Heights neighborhoods along with the Delray neighborhood and Springwells to the north. Today it looks weird as you still have half of the football field left as the nearby Sotke purchased half of the property back in 2015 for expansions that never worked out. Among the most notable alumni of Southwestern High School includes politician Ben Carson and former NBA player Jalen Rose. You also have a handful of 1960s Major League Baseball guys. And since we've already seen the streets that I drove on for the next several minutes, I skipped the video ahead to a church that has a nice design to it, but it's surrounded on all three sides by the massive Detroit water and sewerage facility. The church was built in 1923 before this wastewater facility was constructed here, and it was called the St. John Cantius Roman Catholic Church. In 2007, the church had its last service before becoming the masterpiece of Divinity Church. There hasn't been a service here since 2019. Now here's a story for you, as when I was capturing footage of this church, I was still a fairly new commercially licensed drone pilot. I was still pretty new to the trade, but I was following the rules here as I took the drone off from a public street. So if you take the drone off from a public street or a public sidewalk, for example, you're allowed to fly it up into the air in most states, and you're definitely allowed to in Michigan. However, I had this security guard pull up next to me. She's from the Great Lakes Water Authority, which operates the sewage facility that surrounds this church. And she tells me to stop flying my drone. I ask her why, I asked her what I did. And she said that I wasn't allowed to fly my drone around private property. And I said, okay, but I'm confused. Help me understand. I took the drone off from public property. I just passed my test and that's what it said I could do what am I doing wrong here? And she said, you might be taking it off from public property, but when you fly it, you're seeing private property. But she was wrong. Once you take the drone off from public property, you're able to fly it in the air as long as it's not above critical infrastructure in which the sewage facility does not count as critical infrastructure. There's also no airports nearby, nor are there any jails. So I was definitely legal to fly my drone there. She just didn't know the rule, but she was definitely trying to use her power there so I didn't argue with her I just wrapped everything up put everything back in my car and that took a couple of minutes to do but while I was doing that she parked her car right behind mine to follow me out of there and then I turned the corner up ahead and she spotted me once I made my way down Dearborn towards Jefferson and she followed me for about three blocks down Jefferson. It was definitely annoying, but I've talked about this before as one of my biggest fears when it comes to flying drones is being confronted by authority figures who don't know what they're talking about. And this was one of those cases, but thankfully for me, all she was was a security guard, so she had no power to arrest me or anything like that. But if you're someone who's wanting to fly drones based off of 
watching my videos, just make sure that you know the rules no matter where you go so that you can obviously follow the law, but also protect yourself when it comes to potential situations like this. Anyway, Jefferson Avenue might be the most eerie looking street in all of Delray as it's a wide street with very little traffic and both sides of the street are full of either vacant buildings or vacant lots. And to the right here is the historic Fort Wayne. The fort was built in phases from 1842 to 1851. The original limestone barracks still stand, along with the original 1845 fort. Fort Wayne sits on 96 acres of land in which most of it is operated by the city of Detroit. The remaining area is used as a boatyard by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. In 1958, the fort was listed as a Michigan State Historic Site, and in 1971 it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The fort is named after General Anthony Wayne. The reason for the fort being located here is that in 1840 it was discovered that this was the narrowest part of the Detroit River between Detroit and what was then British Canada. The fort was built here as from this point they were able to fire a cannon across the river along with being able to target potential enemy ships along the Detroit River even though there was never a shot fired from this fort. It later became an induction center for Michigan troops who took part in wars ranging from the Civil War to Vietnam. The fort housed troops during World War I and during World War II it became the Motor Supply Depot. Detroit was a huge supplier of vehicles and weapons during World War II as it had easy access to shipping. Fort Wayne has also housed prisoners of war from Italy at one point. Beginning in 1948, the fort began to be handed over to the city of Detroit in parcels and by 1980, Detroit owned all parts of the fort that it continues to own today. During the summer, visitors are able to visit parts of the fort as the city continues to try and restore all parts of the facility. And this is the abandoned Detroit Harbor Terminal Building which includes 900,000 square feet through 10 stories of reinforced concrete and it was the largest of its kind at the time of completion in 1926. Well if you enjoyed this video you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos on other places like what you saw here can be found in my Detroit playlist, my American Hoods playlist, or in my Michigan playlist. We'll see you next time. Peace!